Why don't we make a start? Uh, I should uh, begin by acknowledging uh, the uh, traditional owners and custodians of the land in which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, uh, and others who may be uh, from their communities who may be here today. So today we uh, have a couple of firsts. Uh, of course, it's the first PhD oration for the year, here at WeHi at any rate, so welcome to that, uh, and to many more that you'll go to throughout the year. And welcome to the first uh, PhD oration by a, a Boomerang student, and you're probably wondering what a Boomerang student is. Uh, this is a first for WeHi, uh, although not a first in Victoria, but the Boomerang program is one which uh, allows people to take their PhD studies uh, in two universities. One at the University of Bonn in Germany and the other uh, here at the University of Melbourne or indeed at the Department of Medical Biology here within the uh, Walter and Eliza Hall Institute uh, and indeed that is what uh, Jonas uh, Moking has done. So the opportunity is afforded to either start your PhD in one country for two years and then move to the uh, uh, other country for one year and, and in that way Jonas has done two years in Germany uh, and one year here in Australia. Uh, the advantage of, of course, doing a program like this is not the, uh, just the uh, ability to study in multiple countries, interact with lots of other people doing the same exchange as you, and we've just had a retreat down to Lawn with a lot of the students, and I think that body of uh, people exchanging scientific and uh, uh, non-scientific support and ideas is a really tremendous opportunity. But also he, at the end of the day, ends up with two PhDs, one from the University of Bonn and one from the University of Melbourne. That does, of course, mean that he has to defend both, the, both PhDs extremely robustly in both cases. And he will be doing that for the <coughs> University of Melbourne here today in front of you. So save up all your really difficult questions for the end. Uh, and I trust you will ask them of him in very stern uh, German manner as well. Uh, we uh, welcome him to the stage for his PhD completion, Jonas Merkel. Thank you, Seth, and welcome to my, to my oration today. Um, I'm Jonas, obviously, and um, I'm going to talk, uh, talk to you about the molecular basis of NLRP1 inflammasome activation. And to start off with, I just want to give you um, yeah, a bit of a refreshment of your memory on what the current model of uh, inflammasome activation looks like. And um, it looks like um, that upon a first signal, which can, for example, be um, a bacterial infection, NF-kappa B induces the transcription of the inflammasome sensor, which is then localized in the cytoplasm of the cell. And here the inflammasome sensor is really thought to act as a cytosolic pattern recognition receptor and, um, yeah, in that way it sends a second signal that can either be pathogenic or danger-associated. And when they do so, they oligomerize into a disk-like oligomer, and uh, then they can recruit the adapter protein ASC, which in turn oligomerizes itself into a large filament, uh, also known as an ASC spec. And this ASC spec can then um, activate or bind and activate caspase 1. And the activation of caspase 1 is really a crucial uh, event in the innate immune response because active caspase 1 can then cleave the proforms of IL 1 beta and IL 18 into their active forms and these can then promote an inflammatory response. Um, the other thing that active caspase 1 does is it cleaves uh, gastermin D, and that uh, leads to a rapid form of cell death called pyroptosis. So for NLRP1, this figure states that anthrax lethal toxin is one of these uh, pathogenic second signals. However, this is only true for, human, uh, for mouse NLRP1 and not for human NLRP1. In human NLRP1, we actually don't know such a direct ligand, uh, such a direct pathogenic ligand that activates NLRP1. And the reason um, why that is different to mouse NLRP1 is that there are differences in the domain architecture when we compare mouse and human NLRP1. But I don't want to talk about that in too much detail today. But when we look at the domain architecture of NLRP1, we can easily see that it's a large multi-domain protein with a molecular weight of 166 kilodalton. And we can find that it has um, an N-terminal pyrin domain, a central Nacht domain, and leucine rich repeats. And up to that point, everything is very similar to any other member of the NLRP protein family. However, what is unique to NLRP1 is that it also has, an, uh, has a C-terminal find and card domain, 
So no other member out of the NLRP proteins, um, out of the NLRP protein family, has these two domains. Um, what has been shown functionally is that the N-terminal pyrin domain is involved in keeping the protein in an auto-inhibited conformation, as well are the leucine-rich repeats. The central NACH domain has been shown to be involved in nucleotide binding and is also known to be involved in oligomerization of the protein. And the C-terminal find domain, and that's actually uh, the most interesting domain, at least I think so, of NLRP1, um, undergoes autolytic cleavage. And what that really means is that without um, interaction with any other enzyme or protein, there is a break of a peptide bond within this domain, and then we really end up with an N-terminal and a C-terminal cleavage fragment. And these two cleavage fragments are thought to remain associated by some sort of non-covalent interaction. And this cleavage domain and the find domain here is really um, a critical event in the activation of NLRP1. So if the protein cannot be cleaved, it cannot be activated. Um, and finally, we have the C-terminal CART domain. And for NLRP1, that's the domain that is really responsible for downstream signaling. So the CART domain is the one that binds ASC. And again, that's a difference to any other member out of the NLRP protein family because all the other members, as I said, don't have this CART domain. They only have a pyrin domain. And so they require the pyrin domain to bind ASC. Now, clinically, it has been shown that NLRP1 is involved in a couple of autoinflammatory diseases. And one of those um, is called, uh, or has been termed, multiple cell filling palm palmoplantar carcinoma. And the patients present with these uh, skin sy symptoms here. And uh, in these patients, mutations have been identified, and they have all been shown to be located in the N-terminal pyrin domain. And when we look at a structure of the pyrin domain, we can see that it forms the six helix bundle fold. And um, here highlighted in red, you can see where these mutations are. And it has been shown mechanistically that um, any of these mutations really lead to a destabilization of this six helix bundle fold and thereby destabilizes the N-terminus of the NLRP1 protein and, uh, then lead, and that leads to hyperactivation of the protein and finally results in the, in the symptoms that we see in the patients. Um, there are a couple of other mutations that have been identified in patients with um, other autoinflammatory syndromes, but um, these mutations, however, it is, it is not quite understood how they lead uh, to hyperactivation of the protein. And finally, there are a couple of um, nucle single nucleotide polymorphisms that uh, have been shown to be involved in vitiligo-associated autoimmunity, and especially for the M1184V polymorphism that is located in the fine domain, it has been shown that this leads to increased fine domain cleavage. As you can see here on the western blot, so the top band here in the wild-type protein is the full-length protein of NLRP1, and the bottom band is the N-terminal cleavage fragment. And you can see that this ratio of uh, full-length to N-terminal cleavage fragment changes when the M1184V polymorphism is introduced. So all in all, these um, polymorphisms and patient mutations helped to get sort of a better understanding of how NLRP1 is regulated and activated. However, the general understanding of the molecular basis of uh, how this regulation and activation of NLRP1 happens is still poor. And to improve that understanding, I asked three key questions throughout my PhD. Um, the first question aiming more at the structure of NLRP1, what is the conformation of full-length NLRP1? The second question uh, about, is about the role of the NACH domain and how, uh, also about how nucleotide binding is involved in NLRP1 activation. And finally, the third question aiming at the role of post-translational modifications in NLRP1 activation. And I first want to talk about the structural part of my project. And when we look into the literature, um, we actually find that there is already some information out there about the structure of NLRP1. There is an NMR structure of the N-terminal pyrin domain that I've already shown you. There is a crystal structure of the leucine-rich repeats, and there is a crystal structure of the C-terminal card domain. And finally, there's a Sachs envelope of a construct spanning the Nacht and LRR domains. So to sum up, there is no high-resolution information uh, available of the, on the Nacht domain and the find domain and also no information about the entire fold of the full-length protein. Uh, 
And one approach that I took back in Bonn was really to look at uh, the Nacht domain and Fine domain by themselves and to purify and crystallize them separately, but I'm not going to talk about that approach today. But I want to focus on the other approach that I took, and that is really to purify and get structural information of the full-length protein. And I was actually able to purify the full-length protein as an N-terminally N-terminal MBP fusion. MBP is short, short for maltose binding protein, which is a commonly used affinity tag in protein purifications. And what you can see here is an elution profile of a size exclusion chromatography of the N-terminally tagged uh, human NLRP1. And um, as you can see, it eludes as a single peak with this sort of shoulder towards the back of the peak. And as you can uh, hopefully appreciate on the SDS page, the protein looks quite pure, um, with some minor impurities down here. And the reason why we end up with these two bands at the top is, again, that the top band is the um, full-length protein, and the bottom band is the N-terminal cleavage fragment. And we sort of confirmed that also by uh, mass spectrometry. Um, so because it looked quite good on the SDS page, we thought to further characterize the protein, and we did so by um, some initial negative stain electron microscopy screens. And when we look at the main peak, we actually found, and that was a bit disappointing, that the protein sample looks quite inhomogeneous, so we get a lot of particles of, of different size and shape in here. But when we look further to the back of the peak, or actually more in this, this uh, what I termed shoulder, we find that the protein sample looks more homogeneous in there. So next, I was, of course, trying to improve the, purifi the protein purification in a way that I can separate more of the, or can get more of the homogeneous protein sample. And I tried a lot of things to do so. So I adjusted uh, the pH of my buffers, tried different salt concentrations, tried to add chemicals like detergents to my buffers. But um, in the end, yeah, I was able to improve the purification, but I cannot 100% tell you what it was that, that really improved it, but it's reproducible. <laughs> Um, and um, yeah, so I was quite happy with that. Um, uh, so I get really get this the second peak, and this is really um, the fraction of the entire protein sample that uh, is thought to be more homogeneous. And what we can already tell from the elution profile and by also running um, a size standard is that this peak uh, eludes as some sort of higher order oligomer because when I run um, a size standard, a molecular weight standard over the same column. The largest protein with 669 kilodalton eludes at about 70 mil, and the peak eludes a bit earlier. And the monomeric weight of, of MBP and LRP1 is 207 kilodalton, so we can already tell that it's probably some sort of higher order oligomer. But of course, we tried now to further characterize this homogeneous protein sample. So what I did is I pooled the fractions of this second peak, concentrated to 1.8 and 2.4 milligram per milliliter, and then further analyzed the sample by size exclusion chromatography and coupled small angle X-ray scattering. And I just want to give you a brief introduction to the technique of size exclusion chromatography and coupled small angle X-ray scattering. So the principle is, again, we put our, uh, or we inject our protein sample uh, onto a size exclusion column, and there we get, again, a separation of inhomogeneous and homogeneous protein. After the column, the protein is directly injected into a capillary where it's exposed to X-rays, and um, the protein then scatters these X-rays, and the scattering pattern is recorded by a detector. And from that scattering pattern, we can actually derive some structural information about the protein particle in here. Um, the most important parameter that we can calculate from that uh, scattering data is uh, called the RG parameter, so that's short for radius of gyration. And this can, this can be calculated in two different ways. And we also recorded the data for two different concentrations. And that's basically just the quality control. So what we want to see is similar values for RG um, for, all the different, for the different ways of how we can calculate uh, the radius of duration and also for the two different concentrations. And I think that's uh, close enough here. And um, so we went on. and. Well, this basically shows us that the protein sample is of good quality. And um, yeah, because we have a good quality sample and good results, we can also then use the radius of gyration because it holds information about the size and shape of the protein particle 
So we can use that information to calculate such a molecular envelope. And what we can do with this molecular envelope is that it gives us a first impression of what the oligomer of NLRP1 might look like. And as you can uh, hopefully appreciate here, it's, it's kind of, yeah, it looks relatively flat. And um, yeah, with some goodwill, it also looks kind of round. <laughs> um, but at least we can, we can say that it might be some sort of disk. And that would be consistent with what has been, with what has been reported in the literature, which is that uh, the, NLRP, the NLRP proteins are generally uh, inflammasome proteins when they are activated go into uh, oligomerase, into a disk-like oligomer. And now, as you can probably imagine, when we can calculate such a molecular envelope, we can also calculate a volume for such a molecular envelope. And then we can use that volume to calculate the molecular weight of the protein particle. And that can then tell us or give us information about the oligomeric state of the protein. And that is what we did. And um, the result that I got was about 1,300 kilodalton. And when we calculate the, the oligomeric state, then um, uh, yeah, based on the monomeric weight of the protein, we get uh, that this oligomer is probably some sort of hexamer. So I just want to add two things here. This, this entire sex experiment is still sort of a work in progress. So I'll have to repeat this experiment to, to confirm the RG values, uh, again, at different concentrations. And the second thing that I want to add is that the uh, approximation that is used to calculate the molecular weight can be inaccurate. So the, especially the data about the oligomeric state and the molecular weight has to, interpret it, has to be interpreted with care. So to sum up the first part of my talk, um, I've shown you that I was able to uh, purify MBP NLRP1 and that in the size exclusion chromatography I get two peaks, one more inhomogeneous uh, protein peak and one more homogeneous protein peak. And the second more homogeneous peak uh, runs as some sort of higher order oligomer in size exclusion chromatography. And this was confirmed by the small angle X-ray scattering data and also the small angle X-ray scattering data suggests that NLRP1 forms some, uh, potentially forms a hexamer. A couple of experiments that I still would like to do in this part of the project. Um, first, I would like to investigate which domains are really involved in forming the NLRP1 oligomer. And to do so, I would like to do a structural mass spec approach um, I would also like to look into whether there are any intramolecular interactions going on, and to do that, I would like to purify uh, single domains and then run analytical size exclusion chromatography with these. And I've actually already started these experiments back in Bonn, and I'm going to continue them when I'm back in Bonn. And finally, of course, it would be really nice to do some more negative stain electron microscopy and finally cryo-EM to really determine the structure of the MBP NLRP1 oligomer. So I've talked a lot about how MBP NLRP1 forms an oligomer now. Um, the domain that is thought to be involved in oligomerization of the protein is the NACH domain. And the NACH domain also has a nucleotide binding site. And I was interested how nucleotide binding <coughs> is involved in the process of NLRP1 activation. And um, when we look into the literature, there's already been some work done on that. So in this study here, they mutated the Walker A motif of mouse NLRP1. The Walker A motif is one of the motifs that is uh, yeah, located within the NACH domain and that is really important for nucleotide binding. So the idea was here that when they mutate this Walker A motif, they don't or they completely impair nucleotide binding. And when they looked at the effect of that, they found that NLRP1 was constitutively active when they mutated the Walker A motif. Now, as I told you at the beginning, mouse and human NLRP1 are a bit different. So there's another study where they did pretty much the same thing. So again, they mutated the Walker A motif. And for both mouse and human, they did that for both mouse and human NLRP1. And in both cases, they found that, again, NLRP1 was constitutively active. And the third study I would like to share with you is more aiming or was more aiming at the question whether NLRP1 hydrolyzes ATP or not. And what they found, uh, so they were able to purify a construct spanning the Nacht and LRA domains of NLRP1. And what they found is that um, NLRP1 does not have any hydrolysis activity. And that was kind of the starting point for me, because as I told you, 
in Bonn, I was able to purify the full-length protein, and we also um, have an assay established in our lab in Bonn that's an HPLC-based assay to determine uh, ATP hydrolysis activity of recombinant protein. So I thought, why not use the recombinant full-length NLRP1 to again look at hydrolysis activity. Um, I have to add here that back when I started these assays, I only had this, this first more inhomogeneous protein sample, so when I go back, I will again have to repeat these uh, experiments with the second homogeneous protein sample. Um, but yeah, how does, how does this assay basically work? Um, we adjust the protein concentration to three micromolar and then add 100 micromolar ATP. Uh, we put that sample into an autosampler of an HPLC device and this autosampler, autosampler takes a sample every 10 minutes and runs the sample over a reversed phase column. And then we measure the absorbance at 254 nanometers, and at 254 nanometers, we can uh, actually detect nucleotides, and thereby we can then determine if there are any changes in the concentrations of ATP, ADP, or AMP in the sample. And when I did that experiment, I interestingly found that MBP and LRP1 seems to have ATP hydrolysis activity. So if you look over here, this is the ATP peak, and you can clearly see how over time it is uh, clearly reduced, and in turn, the second peak, um, ADP, is um, increased, which makes sense, of course. And I can also plot that in a more quantitative way by uh, taking the peak area. So, um, yeah, the result stays the same. Um, ATP decreases and ADP increases. So the conclusion being MVP and LRP1 has hydrolysis activity. And that was interesting because it was different from what was reported in the literature. And of course, we asked the question, okay, how is that or is that physiologically relevant? And the way I wanted to approach this question is by um, mutating the residues involved in nucleotide binding and hydrolysis. So a similar approach as I've shown you, uh, as has been used in the two um, studies that I've shown you. So to identify the residues that are important for ATP hydrolysis and uh, ATP binding, I first did um, a sequence alignment and I aligned the full length sequence of all human NLRP proteins. And I also included NOD1 and NOD2, which are closely related NLR sensors. And here I only highlighted the important motifs involved in nucleotide binding and hydrolysis, which are the Walker A, the Walker B motif, the sensor one and a conserved histidine. And as you can see, these are conserved throughout the entire family of NLRP proteins and also in NLRP1. And next, I wanted to identify which residues out of these motifs are really involved in uh, or direct, are directly involved in nucleotide binding and hydrolysis. And to do so, I wanted to do a structural assessment of the nucleotide binding site. And as I've told you, there is no high resolution structure of the NACH domain available. So what I did is I made a model of NLRP1. And um, I based that model on the crystal structure of the NOT2 NACH domain simply because these two NACH domains are very closely related. And you can see the NLRP1 NACH domain model in purple here and the um, NOT2 crystal structure as an overlay in gray. And when we then take a closer look at the nucleotide binding site, it's actually fairly easy to identify the residues that are important. Um, so if we zoom in on this, you can see ADP here, and you can see that the lysine residue and the serine residue, as well as the conserved histidine, align nicely around the beta phosphate of ADP, and that the arginine of sensor 1 and the glutamate of Walker B are a bit further away. So therefore, I concluded that the first three residues that I mentioned are most likely involved in nucleotide binding, and the last two residues that I mentioned are probably involved in ATP hydrolysis. So this is basically just summed up what I presented you in the movie, and this is also consistent with uh, what is found, uh, what is described in the literature for these residues. So, yeah, now I had identified the important residues, so I could go in and mutate them. I just needed an assay to to measure inflammasome activation, um, to yeah, to investigate what what the effect of these mutations is, and. What we have established in the master's lab is um, a really nice assay called an SPEC assay that we can use to, to measure inflammasome activation. And how that work, works is that we have 293 T cells that express ASC RFP. 
And under normal conditions, you, as you can see here, the ASC RFP is really distributed throughout the entire cell. And when we now transfect in our NLRP1 and activate it, the ASC focuses into one spot and so does the RFP. And in that way, we can really easily distinguish these two. And um, we can also easily quantify that by doing a fax analysis. And the gating strategy here is that we plot the width of the RFP signal over the area of the RFP signal, and then we really end up with these two populations, the top population um, representing the unstimulated uh, conditions and the bottom population being the cells that have these aspects. So now I had an assay and I knew which residues to uh, mutate. So I went in and did the assay. And as you can see here, I pretty much got the same result as has been described in the literature before. Um, so when we first compare, so I used the S1213A here as a negative control. The S1213A mutation is a mutation that is actually in the find domain and completely abrogates find domain cleavage. So this is really just a negative control. But when we then look at the Walker A mutations, so these two bars over here, and when we look at the conserved histidine, and I also try to combine two mutations to see if I get an additional effect, but all of them pretty much lead to increased spec formation, and that basically means uh, we have constitutively active NLRP1. So the next step, of course, was to look at the residues involved in ATP hydrolysis, and when I mutated these, uh, I found the same thing. So again, I mutate the residues involved in ATP hydrolysis, and the idea here is that really ATP is still able to bind into the pocket, but can really just not be hydrolyzed anymore, but still ATP, uh, NLRP1 seems to be constitutively active. So my conclusion from that was basically that maybe NLRP1 requires ATP hydrolysis activity to adapt an auto-inhibited conformation. Um, just to make sure that any of these mutations don't affect fine domain cleavage or the interaction of the NNC terminal cleavage fragment, I did another experiment. I did an immunoprecipitation experiment with, an, uh, with a C-terminally flag-tagged NLRP1. So what that means is that, again, when NLRP1 undergoes autolytic cleavage, we end up with an N-terminal and a C-terminal cleavage fragment. And in that case, uh, in, in my case, we have the uh, flag tag on the C-terminal cleavage fragment. So I can pull down the full-length protein and the C-terminal cleavage fragment with the um, flag, and, uh, with flag beads. And um, by doing the IP, I can look then at the interaction of the N and C-terminal cleavage fragments. And when I looked at, it by, at this by Western blot, um, yeah, what you can see is for the wild type, you see the top band with the NLRP1 antibody is again the full-length protein. The bottom band is the N-terminal cleavage fragment. And with the flag antibody, I can detect the C-terminal cleavage fragment. I used the A66V patient mutation that I've shown you at the beginning as a control for a protein that leads to hyperactivation of the protein. And as you can see, this one does not have an effect on fine domain cleavage. I used the M1184V polymorphism as a control for, for a mutation that increases fine domain cleavage. And you can clearly see that there's more of the N-terminal and C-terminal cleavage fragments um, in this sample. And finally, I used the S1213A mutation uh, as a control for a protein that cannot undergo cleavage anymore. And yeah, as you can see, there's really no cleavage fragment at all. And when I looked at this uh, for my uh, nucleotide binding and hydrolysis mutants, I found that none of them really have an effect on fine domain cleavage. And when I looked at that in the IP, I found that, again, um, the mutations in the nucleotide binding site, um, either binding or hydrolysis mutants, do not have an effect on the interaction of the N and C terminal cleavage fragments. So to sum up the second part of the talk, I've shown you that MBP NLRP1 exhibits ATP hydrolysis activity and that impairing this hydrolysis activity by mutating either the residues involved in nucleotide binding or really just the residues that are responsible or required for ATP hydrolysis leads to increased activation of NLRP1 and finally, I've shown you that impaired hydrolysis does not affect fine domain cleavage or the interaction of the N and C terminal cleavage fragments. A couple of experiments that I still want to do. I mean, I've already mentioned that I still need to do some more of the hydrolysis assays with the second peak of the MBP and RP1 purification. And I would also like to measure the different mutants in the hydrolysis assay. And uh, finally, I would 
I would still like to do some overexpression experiments in THP1s to confirm the results that I've seen in the spec assays uh, on the cytokine level, because that's really the final readout for inflammasome activation. And yeah, now to the final question of my talk. And um, this was, again, more aiming at post-translational modifications. And one reason why I looked at that is that when you go into Uniprot, so one of my favorite resources to find information on proteins, uh, which I think you're all familiar with. Um, and if we look at the entry for NLRP1 and then go to um, PTM and processing, we find that the only entry there is uh, cleavage by autolysis in the find domain. So there's actually not much known about post-translational modifications in NLRP1. And I mean, it's, it's a huge multi-domain protein. It's therefore very likely that it does have some sort of post-translational modifications and probably these modifications also affect the activity of the protein. So the first thing I wanted to look at, and um, I want to add that this project was actually initiated by Alan, a postdoc in our lab, and he was so kind to let me continue this work. Um, so I wanted to look at the functional effects that uh, fine domain cleavage has uh, on NLRP1 inflammasome activation, and I did so by introducing the M1184V polymorphism, which again increases fine domain cleavage. And I also used the A66V patient mutation in these experiments as a positive control. And I looked at these, uh, I looked at the effect of these mutations by again uh, doing a spec assay. And there's a couple of effects going on here, so let me just guide you through this, uh, through this plot. So when we first compare the wild type and A66V mutation, which is an autoactivating mutation, we see increased spec formation for the A66V mutation, which is what we expect because it is an autoactivating mutation. Um, when we look at the M1184V polymorphism by itself, we see that it doesn't really have any effect. If anything, it shows slightly reduced uh, spec formation compared to the, to the wild type protein. And that was actually first a bit counterintuitive because um, when we think of, of increased fine domain cleavage and we know that cleavage is required for activation, we would probably expect more activation of the protein. And then when we, add, uh, when we added the A66V patient mutation on top of the M1184V polymorphism, so an autoactivating signal for NLRP1 together with the increased fine domain cleavage, we found even increased uh, spec formation compared to the A66V by itself, meaning that probably the A66V together with the M1184V does somehow synergize in terms of uh, NLRP1 activation. So next I wanted to try and see if I can reproduce this with another activating stimulus for NLRP1. And I've already told you at the beginning that, um, NLRP, that there's no direct pathogenic ligand known for NLRP1, but um, DPP9 recently has been described as a negative regulator of NLRP1. And just briefly about DPPs. DPP is short for dipeptidyl peptidase. It's a class of serine proteases that cleaves off N-terminal dipeptides from proteins that have a proline or alanine in the second position. And um, the DPPs are known to have multiple physiological roles. And apparently, one role of DPP9 is to somehow keep NLRP1, NLRP1 inhibited. And what has also been shown is that when we inhibit DPP9 by adding talabastat, um, we get an activated NLRP1. So I thought I could use that as an activating stimulus. And again, I was looking at whether this activating stimulus, again, synergizes with the M1184V polymorphism. And interestingly, that's not what I found. So again, there's a couple of effects going on here. Um, so first, when we just compare the two wild type bars, uh, without telabastat, we are still at baseline. And with telabastat, we get increased spec formation. So the activation by telabastat works in this assay. And then when we look at the A66V patient mutation, there's already something interesting going on because um, I would have thought that the A66V patient mutation is an autoactivating intrinsic signal and then the protein is active. And I wouldn't really have expected an additional effect of telabastat, but we see a very strong additional effect of telabastat. So that was already interesting. And then when we look at the M1184V polymorphism, we again see um, an effect of the telabastat, so increased spec formation. But I didn't, again, uh, we didn't see the result that we expected because uh, 
when we now compare the um, A66V M1184V combined mutation um, to the M1184V with um, the telabostat as an activating stimulus, I would have expected this, these, that these two bars um, yeah, show the same result, basically, but we don't get that. And therefore, we sort of uh, concluded that maybe these are two different mechanisms by how NLRP1 can be activated. And then I just wanted to check um, or make sure that uh, Talabostat doesn't just affect fine domain cleavage uh, or the interaction of the NNC terminus. And again, to look at this, I did uh, an immunoprecipitation experiment. And what I found was, was basically that um, yeah, Talabostat does not affect fine domain cleavage. So when we, for example, compare the two wild-type proteins or the A66V patient mutation, we don't see an effect of the Talabostat. And we also don't see an effect on the interaction of N and C terminal cleavage fragments. So to sum up that first bit of the post-translational modification part is um, I've shown you that NLRP1 or activating NLRP1 by destabilizing the pyrin domain by introducing the A66V patient mutation synergizes with increased fine, fine domain cleavage induced by the M1184V polymorphism. And um, interestingly, we don't see that synergistic effect when we activate NLRP1 with uh, telabostat, so the DPP9 inhibitor. And therefore, the conclusion again that these might be two different mechanisms how NLRP1 is activated in that system. So, of course, the question is, what could these two different mechanisms be? Um, and again, I went into the literature, and this is actually, I think, the most interesting part of the talk. Um, um, I'm also almost done, so just two more slides. <laughs> um, so yeah, what I found is, is this manuscript where they described uh, structure-based or where they did made a structure-based alignment of human caspase recruitment domains, short card domains, and I thought, well, NLRP1 has a card domain, so there might be something interesting in there. And um, what I found was that they described that NLRP1 has a conserved tyrosine residue in um, a patch of the card domain which is known to be important to mediate protein-protein uh, interactions. And this tyrosine residue is also conserved in the proteins ASC and RIP2. And in these two proteins, it has been shown that a phosphorylation event of this conserved tyrosine residue is essential for this uh, patch of the card domain to, to really facilitate protein-protein interaction. So I looked at this again in a spec assay, and I looked at this by mutating this conserved tyrosine residue to a phenylalanine. The reason why I choose phenylalanine is that it's um, structurally closely related to, to tyrosine. And I looked at this um, by trying to activate it uh, with two different stimuli. So again, telabostat, and with telabostat again, we get increased spec formation, so activation of NLRP1, and I used the um, Walker B mutation, uh, which is one of the ATP hydrolysis mutation that I introduced in the second part of my talk, which also leads to increased activation of NLRP1. Um, so when I looked at this together with the uh, mutated conserved tyrosine, I found that in both cases, so when I activate this, uh, this, mutation, uh, this mutated protein with um, telabostat, I didn't get any spec formation. And also when I put the E414Q mutation on top of the uh, mutation of the tyrosine, I also didn't get any spec formation. And in this essay, again, I used the S1213A mutation, which completely abrogates fine domain cleavage as a negative control. So to sum up this last bit, um, uh, the NLRP1 uh, card domain has um, a conserved tyrosine that is potentially phosphorylated, and that phosphorylation site is, uh, or that phosphorylation event might really be important for uh, NLRP1 <coughs> activation. And what I could imagine, and that's a bit speculative, but um, what I could imagine is that maybe DPP9 is not targeting NLRP1 directly, but is targeting the kinase that phosphorylates NLRP1 at that tyrosine residue. And what happens then when we inhibit DPP9 by uh, adding telabostat to our cells that um, DPP9 cannot direct that kinase to the N-terminal degradation pathway anymore. We get an increased amount of that kinase in the cell. We get increased phosphorylation of NLRP1 and therefore increased activation in the spec assay. Again, this is very hypothetical, but I'm looking forward to your comments. <laughs> 
A um, couple of experiments that I would still like to do is um, a screening of tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Um, yeah, one, one thing is that I really want to show that uh, phosphorylation event is really crucial for NLRP1 activation. And what we might also be able to do in this uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor screening is to identify the kinase that is responsible for phosphorylating NLRP1. And I would like to do an immunoprecipitation experiment of NLRP1 uh, overexpressed in 293T cells together with ASC or caspase one overexpressed to really show that this uh, uh, tyrosine mutation completely abrogates the interaction with the ASC protein. And now to the most important part of my talk. Um, this picture, picture I was just talking to Seth about this uh, was taken um, pretty much one year ago, so when I first came here, I think this, this was my uh, second day in Australia. And um, what we did is that um, Seth invited us to have, a, have uh, two, three days out of the lab and spend them at uh, his parents' farm. And we got to do a lot of really Aussie things, like um, bushwalking uh, to, to a waterfall or uh, watching the glowworms at night um, or feeding the cows. So uh, that was a really nice, nice start of a really nice year for me. So um, yeah, thank, thanks, Seth, for welcoming me here at uh, WeHire. And um, thanks as well to uh, Alan, who really uh, introduced me to a lot of the techniques used in the master's lab, of which I didn't really know any, to be honest. <laughs> so he had to be uh, quite patient with me, and um, he was. Um, and thanks to the entire master's lab, basically, for, for really being a great environment to do, to do science in. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks everyone. Um, thanks to my lab in Germany as well. Um, that's all of us cramped up in, uh, in a lift. Um, I still don't know why we did that picture, but we did. Um, here in the middle, you can see Matthias, my supervisor back in Germany. Um, so thanks to him as well for, for giving me the opportunity to work on that project. And I would like to thank a couple of other people as well. Um, my PhD committee, Chris, Sandra, and James, who without even knowing me, uh, agreed to be on my committee. <laughs> Um, and um, yeah, especially thanks to James, who helped a lot with the, with the structural part of my project and gave really good advice. Um, thanks to many people from his lab as well, Chiri, Sam, Lung Yu, and Alexandra, and um, thanks to Alex Uboldi from the Tonkin lab, who helped me a lot with um, doing some toxoplasma experiments um, that I didn't get to present today. Um, Thanks to the entire inflammation division for also being a great environment to do science in and always helping out with reagents or, or anything that you need, uh, even if it's a beer at the pub. Um, and yeah, finally, thanks to the Boomerang for providing PhD students like me with the opportunity to go overseas for one year, for an entire year, and do, do research in a, in a different lab. And thanks to my family and friends as well for always supporting me. And finally, thanks to you for listening. And if you have any questions, go ahead. <laughs> any questions for Jonas? Yeah, at the back. Hi, Jonas. I'm interested in your ATPase assay. Uh -huh. um, it seemed to me like it was quite a low level of conversion or, or hydrolysis of ATP. It's a really low rate, yeah. Do you, do you think that it's, that's a, that's a, it is a true ATPA? Like, how, how confident can you be? Yeah, how confident can you be? <laughs> um, whoops. Um, I think, so it is, it is really, it is quite reproducible. We do see it again and again. Um, the, late, the rate is very low, but, um, this class of uh, protein or this family of protein called triple ATPases that have this um, Nacht or Nacht-like domains, um, they are thought to really not do a lot of ATP hydrolysis, um, but to really just um, be bound to either ADP or ATP. And when they are activated, they are thought to be bound to, to ATP and then undergo one round of hydrolysis to adopt an inhibited fold again. So that might explain why the rate is relatively low. Yeah. Have you done um, any sort of 
something to confirm that your pool length protein is actually what you think it is, and not some sort of a... The MBP and LRP1? Yeah, so I'm a bit worried that it looks like that first peak is maybe a void volume. It is a void volume, yeah, that's, that's correct. kind of a lot lower, and you kind of boosted it. Like, is the, is the species that you've purified in that second peak really what you think it is? Like, how have you confirmed that? Uh, yeah, we, we, we did mass spec okay. on the protein on the top and the bottom band, so it's it's also both NLRP1. Yeah, we did mass spec. Are you surprised? It, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not an expert on SACs, but are you surprised you didn't see any sort of six-fold symmetry? Like it's, it seems very asymmetrical in terms of the amount of protein that's being produced. Yeah, you know? yeah, true. So um, I'm also not a huge expert on sex, but um, <laughs> it's James here. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think what can what can I mean calculated based on one parameter, so that I think can already produce some noise, and also also the um, averaging that has to be done with the scattering data also produces I think a lot of noise. So that might be a reason why it looks not very symmetrical. Take turns from the left to the right or the right to the left. I'll start. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the the, the virus resolution you showed was, was really interesting data. Um, if you make a phosphomimetic mutation at that residue, do you think that would be autoactive? Um, I haven't tried that yet. Um, I ordered the oligos to do that mutation. However, with the tyrosine residue, it's quite difficult to do a phosphomimetic because tyrosine is just so big. And so even if I put in a glutamic acid residue, it might be too small to have the same effect as a phosphorylated tyrosine. But I will try, and I wouldn't think that it's that just this mutation causes um, constitutive activation, but that we might need uh, some other activating effect. Ed, that's similar with lines. Did you just try IFD those proteins in the overexpression? No, also, I also haven't done that experiment, but yeah, like something like a phosphor enrichment experiment to confirm that this residue is actually phosphorylated would be good as well, yeah. Oh, is, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that would be much easier than doing a mass spec experiment. <laughs> yeah, I had a question in relation to the cleavage fragment. Mm -hmm. So in the M1184V, you, you said that it increases it with the autolytic cleavage. And then, so you did the aspect assay and you saw that there was less aspect. So you were looking at higher domain polymerizing with ASC in that assay. So because in the other NLR proteins, there's no card domain at the C terminal. Yeah. Whereas there's a card domain in that cleavage <coughs> fragment. Have you looked to see if that card domain is somehow oligomerizing and activating caspase one at all? No, I haven't looked. I haven't looked at direct caspase one activation. Yeah. Um, but just just to be clear again, the pyrin domain of NLRP one is really just auto inhibitory. It doesn't interact with uh, ASC at all. So it's really just auto inhibitory. It's the card domain that induces spec formation as well. But I haven't looked at uh, the card domain directly activating caspase one yet. I always ask the same question of James Vitz when he talks about these NLRP things, and that's how does <laughs> potassium efflux activate there? Have you got any? So potassium efflux is not thought to activate NLRP1, but NLRP3, and uh, right, so I don't know as much about board. NLRP3. <laughs> 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 Thanks, that was an easy answer. <laughs> Do you want to tell David what your ATP hypothesis is for NLRP1? For NLRP1, well, my ATP hydrolysis, you're talking about ATP hydrolysis? Yeah, auto, auto inhibition. Yeah, so I think that um, the ATP hydrolysis, that one ATP hydrolysis event is required for NLRP1 to adopt an auto inhibited conformation and then be auto inhibited at first. That's my idea of, of the requirement of ATP hydrolysis for NLRP1. Um, can you, um, from your negative stay in EM, can you see any um, any hint of 
features that might allow you to classify and start averaging that? Like, have, how closely have you looked at those micrographs, the negative stain that came out of that middle peak that you think is, no. is oligomeric, but you know, maybe a single oligomeric species? Yeah, I haven't looked at it closely enough to do so, but of course that would be n nice to do that, um, especially to kind of confirm what we've seen. I'm, I'm not, I'm also not an EM expert, um, but um, I think what we could do is uh, do averaging, and um, I think we can we could calculate some sort of uh, envelope as well, and maybe like to confirm the the um, small angle X-ray scattering data. That would be nice to do, but we haven't looked at it close enough yet. Yeah, Chris. Okay, one last question. Could you elaborate on that model? So you think that NLRP one acts as a sensor for ATP, and in the absence of ATP, then you can get activation of NLRP one, NLRP one influenza. Is that right? Mm, not exactly. So. Um, I don't think that NLRP1 is actually sensing ATP levels. I just think that this ATP um, hydrolysis event is required for NLRP1 to adopt an auto-inhibited auto uh, conformation. Yeah. I think that in general, in any cell, the ATP levels are so high that there will always be enough ATP for this to happen. But That's what I would assume. If you've got a cell that is you know, infected with a pathogen or it's dying, then its level of ATP might drop. Yeah, so so one of the studies that I've actually shown you um, suggests or has results that suggests that um, decreasing levels of ATP or low levels of ATP do activate NLRP1. Um, so that would be consistent with that. But yeah, I'm I'm not 100% sure about it. An area for discussion over coffee, perhaps. Uh, in summary, uh, it's wonderful when your students start to take after you scientifically. You don't, of course, expect them to take after your sense of dress, but obviously you can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, guys, for a wonderful talk. Thank you.